Happy Wednesday, everyone. It is noon. You are watching CBC News BC. I am Jessica Chung here in the CBC Vancouver newsroom. Let's get you caught up on your top stories. Now, if you're driving in BC's interior, a heads up. Drive BC says Highway 97 south of Peachland is closed in both directions for four kilometers because of a wildfire. Now, this is in between Brent and Renfrew roads. It says no detours are available and vehicles will be turned around. Now, the out of control blaze is less than a hectare in size right now, and heat warnings are in effect across BC, and officials say that could fuel the growth of new and existing fires. The Thompson Nicola Regional District and the Cooks Ferry Indian Band have issued a water conservation notice for Spence's Bridge. And that's because water use is exceeding production capacity, and this is emptying local wells. Now, all outdoor watering must stop for 135 customers. And if necessary, the BC Wildfire Service will draw water to fight fires from other sources, including the Thompson River. And BC Hydro says it will invest around a billion dollars for projects in Surrey over the next decade and that the money will be used to upgrade and expand the electricity grid as well as provide clean power for homes and businesses. Some of the projects um, that we have underway will support the load growth and increased customer connections. They include two new substations in Surrey Centre and Campbell Heights. We're redeveloping the Scott Road substation in the north, and we're going to expand the McClellan substation. And together, these projects will power almost 160,000 new homes in Surrey. BC Hydro says the planned investment is a result of the growing demand for electricity due to population growth, housing construction, and increased industrial development. Now, a stretch of Highway 17 in Surrey is still closed this morning after a head-on crash between two tractor trailers last night. You can see the pics right here. Now, police say three people were injured, including a 41-year-old man who was the driver of one of the vehicles. He's still in hospital with serious injuries. And the driver and passenger of the other tractor trailer, two men, one 44 years old and the other 64, have since been released from the hospital. Now, the crash happened in the area of 130. 6th Street and Highway 17 at around 8 p.m. Police are still trying to figure out what caused the crash, but say that speed may have been a factor. UBC, SFU and UVic say BC's latest cap on the intake of international students won't impact their operations. Now, the province has brought in some new guidelines for public post-secondary education institutions, and this includes capping the number of international students at 30% of their total enrollment. And the guidelines will also require them to submit international education strategic plans to the government, and this all kicks in this month. And you may have seen it if you looked up yesterday in Vancouver in the evening, right here, the sky lit up in red, white, and green. Well, that was from a flyover at the Italian Air Force acrobatic team known as Frecce Triculuri. The Air Force team are on the tour of Canada and the US and it started in Quebec in late June and will end in Eastern US in late August. Very cool. And that's it from me. I am Jessica Chung. You are watching CBC News BC. Stay with us for continuous news updates. BC Today with Michelle Elliott is up next in just a few minutes. Don't go anywhere.
good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. The horrifying death of an 11-year-old boy in foster care is sparking yet another call for change within the child welfare system. We'll hear from the First Nations Leadership Council and a group representing community social services. And we'll ask you, do you think change is possible? How do we overhaul the much beleaguered system to prevent future tragedies? In the second half hour, more stores are moving away from taking cash. Is that fair? We'll take your thoughts on protecting cash as payment. I'm Michelle Elliott. Welcome to BC Today. The scathing report from the representative of children and youth refers to this young 11-year-old boy as a pseudonym, Colby. He came from a First Nation in the Fraser Valley. Colby was an avid soccer player and loved to play Minecraft. At school, he excelled in math and sciences. Colby experienced a turbulent life at home, and he was placed in government care. In February 2021, Colby was found badly beaten. Paramedics flew him to hospital, but he died. A year ago, his caregivers were sentenced to 10 years for aggravated assault and manslaughter. It is a horrifying and gut-wrenching case that points to multiple failures in the child welfare system, according to the report by the representative. Jennifer Charlesworth is a representative for children and youth. Our investigation into Colby's story points to a series of critical errors made by the Ministry of Children and Family Development, most notably a failure to complete basic prior contact and criminal record checks on the extended family caregivers, either before or after Colby and his siblings were placed in the home. Had these checks been completed, it's unlikely we'd all be here today for this purpose. Anytime I see a young life short, I am overwhelmed with anguish, and sadly, that happens a lot. I spent a lot of time in this role, crying. This was an innocent young boy who should have had no worries except perhaps whether or not he would score a goal in his next soccer game or get to the next level of a video game. He should have been able to be happy, carefree. Instead, he became the center of headlines, homicide detectives at meetings, and debates in the legislature. Charles Ruth's report calls for a system-wide change that includes more accountability for child welfare workers and more agency for children and First Nations. It is by far not the first time a tragic case has occurred and led to calls for change. We're going to hear from the First Nations Leadership Council in a moment, as well as a social worker. You can hear, you can share your own reaction to this report on our open line too. And if you have experience with the child welfare system, let us know too, do you think change is possible? And how do we overhaul this much beleaguered child welfare system? You can call us 1-800-825-5950-604-669-3733. You can hit pound 690 on your cell phone. You can also email bctoday at cbc.ca. Joining me now is Cheryl Casimer. She's a First Nations Summit political executive and a member of the First Nations Leadership Council. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's uh, a, a tragic case and it just um, it, it is gut-wrenching but also infuriating when you hear about yet another horrif horrifying case and the mismanagement and uh, failures that have led to it that this report exposes. It is and sometimes the the pain is just too much to bear, knowing that this child lived in those conditions along with his sibling mm. and there was no safety net for him whatsoever. The mm. simplest things that could have been done, um, you know, didn't, did not happen, did not take place. Um, things that are supposed to have, supposed to happen when a child is in care didn't take place. So it's really um, disheartening and frustrating and, um, you know, my heart bleeds and hurts uh, for his siblings and uh, for his family and his community as well as his nation. There were concerns raised about a lack of uh, background checks, criminal background checks, as well as lack of visitation of Colby and his sibling. 
Um, and uh, although uh, social workers are supposed to visit every 90 days, uh, he had not been visited in the seven months leading up to his death. I mean, what, uh, what was your reaction to hearing that? Well, that in itself is a colossal failure on its own. Um, when you're responsible for the well-being of a child and that child's life is put into your hands and put into your care, you need to do the utmost and take that responsibility to the utmost to make sure that all of the measures are in place to ensure the safety and well-being and happiness of that child. So um, we've been talking with uh, Minister Lore in terms of making some immediate changes. And one of those, of course, would be the, the visitation uh, requirements that says social workers have to check in on a child who's been put into care every 90 days. Mm -hmm. For agencies that operate, Indigenous agencies that operate under the Aboriginal operational practice standards, it says in there that social workers have to visit children after they've been put into placement um, every 30 days. Hmm. And so we've been asking, why is it 90 days? We think that's a bit too long. Hmm. Um, we're not suggesting that it has to be 30 either, but maybe meet in the middle because we understand the caseload that um, social workers have in mainstream is quite high. And, you know, it does put a strain on, on them. Um, so we've also talked about the casework load with social workers mm. as well, and we need to do something about that. That is, that is an issue that has been raised um, repeatedly, right? I mean, really over many years now, the workload uh, faced by uh, child welfare workers, the high turnover, um, and the shortage uh, as well. How do we, uh, what what's led to that and how do we, uh, address that shortage? Well, I think that it's um, because of a colonial a a archaic system, right? The, the existing child welfare system is not meeting the needs of anybody. And without any systemic changes to that system, uh, social workers are going to continue to be faced with that um, the, the high caseloads uh, of children. So we need to make some changes as mm. per Dr. Charlesworth's um, recent report, uh, Don't Look Away. Um, Leadership Council is in full support of those proposed recommendations, and we're calling on Minister Lohr to work towards implementing those changes right away. So mm -hmm. it, I think that if the social workers had more of a, um, a network of, of professionals and support to, to support them as they're dealing with each case, that they may be able to deal with it in a, like they, they'd be able to, to review it in detail um, and be able to determine, okay, what does this child need? Who's going to be able to meet those needs best? And how do we do that collaboratively? And what changes specifically, what recommendations stand out for you? There are, there are a number of them. The minister says that there, she accepts, uh, she's accepted the report um, and uh, is implementing them. She says there's been um, an audit of visits as well, uh, just in, in the last month that they've published and that uh, that's shown that visits have been t um, uh, conducted. But what are the recommendations that you would really like to see uh, implemented? Well, I'd like to see them all implemented. I don't know if you sure. can really look at that report and say that you want to just pick one over the other. I think they need to happen um, in parallel with each other, if possible, I know it's a it's a huge ask, and with the looming election um, just ahead of us, it, there may be some challenges with that. But one of the commitments that Minister Lore made yesterday was that she was going to get a senior officials group set up right away with all of the various ministries and departments, so health, education, poverty reduction, housing, have them come together and start working on a strategic plan. Mm. So her um, Jennifer, or sorry. Um, Dr. Charlesworth, uh, one of her recommendations, um, you know, was talking about breaking down silos right. and the necessity for that so that people can work in collaboration with each other and support one another. Um, so if that could be put into place right away, um, the commitment that Minister Laura made, then that would go a long way of making sure that even prior and during election, work will still be happening to implement those recommendations. Mm. Do you see um, this? Uh, pardon me. Um, I apologize. Go oh, ahead. No, go. go. Um, okay, so I was up. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to say, jump on your point there about the election coming up, because do you see this? Um, 
becoming an election issue, you mentioned housing. You know, there's been so much of a focus on housing, and that is one of the factors that can lead to uh, vulnerability, you know, living in poverty. Um, how do you include that in an, an election conversation, in the election debate? Well, you know what, one of the one of the uh, priority areas that is not an election issue and should be is the issue around child welfare and child mm -hmm. well-being. Um, and I think that we need to, you know, uh, put the pressure on on all of the um, parties to make sure that that is that is a priority and a highlight in their campaign, um, because we need to be looking at child well-being from a uh, a holistic approach, a holistic view, it includes everything that impacts a child. Mm -hmm. So anything that impacts the life of a child that's gone into care, or even prior to care, because if we could focus a lot on prevention, mm. um, then we wouldn't have to be worrying a lot about protection. So if we could focus our energies on providing preventative wraparound services and supports to families and that are in need, um, the less likelihood we're going to see them moving into the into the protection um, component of the of the system. Uh, Ms. So yes, with this with with this, uh, with, with this um, committee or group of senior officials that the minister is talking about, you know, housing would be at the table, and they would all be responsible for determining, you know, a path forward, uh, despite the. The election coming up, um, she's indicated that once this group is in place, they would be responsible for carrying out the work, um, even throughout the period um, after the rich has dropped. They would still be still be able to carry out some of that work, and we are just going to need to make sure that we apply pressure to to the parties and say like, what is what is your commitment to ensuring that these recommendations are going to be fully implemented? I know that Premier Eby and his government say that they're fully committed, but in the event that there's a changeover. What is the other party's commitment to that? And we need to know that. Cheryl Casimer, it's very, very good and important to hear from you today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Cheryl Casimer spoke to us from Windermere in uh, BC. And Cheryl is a member of the Upcom First Nation in Cranbrook, and which is one of the Tunaha Nation communities. We are taking your calls now. What is your reaction to this report from the uh, representative for children and youth? It's called Don't Look Away. And Jennifer Charles Roth says uh, that this case, a horrifying case of the death of an 11-year-old boy, is uh, one to spark change. And it's a story not that we should not be looking away from and that there should be sweeping change as a result. So is that change possible? And how do we overhaul the child welfare system. What's your reaction to what you heard from Cheryl Casimir? Should this be uh, an election issue? You can call us 1-800-825-5950-604-669-3733, pound, pound 690 on your cell phone. And you can also email us bctoday at cbc.ca. It's 1219 Pacific time. Here's more now from Jennifer Charlesworth. First and foremost is that in the course of doing this work, we did a tremendous amount of outreach. So we reached out um, through community agencies, families, service providers, foster caregivers, and there were over 2,000 people that contributed to us understanding the issues in the, in the uh, system right now and the possible solutions. So there is a tremendous amount, it's a very strong circle of people that are saying, yes, it's absolutely time. The second reason is that the system is fundamentally incapable right now of meeting the needs of kids. We've got significant staff shortages. We've got situations in which there's no way that they can even find places to put children uh, if they do need to come into care. There's a lack of supports. So it's almost like the system is on its knees. And so there's no choice but to do something different than what we're doing. It's just impossible for the system to respond in the way that it has in the past. And the third thing is, I actually feel like the the minister's response and the government's response has been very authentic and persistent. We have had conversations for quite some time. They've been exploring what they can do, what are the opportunities prior to the election. And so it feels different to me.
for taking your calls on this. As BC's representative for children and youth calls for a complete overhaul of the province's foster care model, this following the abuse and death of an 11-year-old boy in 2021. You can let us know your reaction to this uh, report and to the call for changes at the ministry and the child welfare system. Do you think it is possible? And if you've had experience with the foster care system, the child welfare system, what do you think is needed? Is that change possible? Our number is 1-800-825-5950-604-669-3733. You can hit pound 690 as well. And Deborah is calling us from North Vancouver. Hi, Deborah. Yes, hello. Thank you so much for calling. Um, what are your thoughts today? Well, I know for a fact that being Métis, I'm not entitled to anything whatsoever. Um, we relocated to BC once I was 10 years old, and I wasn't really concerned about my Indian heritage, except everyone back in Regina was. My uncle was the chief, Chief Pelche of Saskatchewan, mm. and he had tried and, and got really far, actually, before he died. Um, yeah, he passed away um, trying to get um, our rights, get us, you know, more, you know, uh, opportunities, anything other than just schooling. We're not entitled to anything because we aren't um, considered Indians and um, whatever we want to say. Anyways, until I found out when I was over 40 years old and unplanned pregnancy, my son was perfect, 10 days old. They came in for a second weighing. I'm like saying, I questioned this to the nurses, and they said, don't worry about it. The look on her face, I knew she walked out the door and locked it. There was police, like I'm talking about six foot four, and they were like 20s, like, I mean, unbelievable. There was like six of them outside my window of the, the hospital room. They said, um, you have 15 minutes to either get out of the building or we're going to take you know take you away and like arrest you and I'm like what do you uh, I don't understand what's going on and and then they showed me the paper I had signed saying I was indigenous mm-hmm. and I'm like okay what what's what does that have to do with thing and they said look you have to talk to whoever is somewhere else to get out and I said well not without my son they said he's not even in the building anymore mm. they took him and he's gone oh and we aren't going to see him ever again and I'm like. I, I, no, 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 this isn't happening. I'm, I'm having uh, like a nightmare or something. And uh, that was the beginning of the end there. I never did see him again. What was they the reasoning? Into, what was the reasoning given to you, Deborah? They, well, I know that it was once I signed that document that everything changed, but they said mm-hmm. that it was because the father who got married like within a month or two after this, I had nothing to do with him. They said that we're scared that you're going to have contact with him and he's got a criminal record in his past, mm-hmm. something to do with um, guns, uh, 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 um, hunting mm-hmm. guns, rifles or whatever. And, and uh, he had them in a closet or something. And they, they said something happened sometime way before I knew him. Okay. And I'm like, this can't be happening. So I, I went, because uh, I was on social services, right. I, my only relief was to go to um, legal aid. And he more or less said within five minutes of talking to him, look, I'm going to be straight with you. You don't stand a chance against these people. They all call me and the same thing happens with all the girls. Well, more or less just um, go through all the hoops and everything. They make you do everything. And, and no matter what you do, it's never good enough. And it's not going to amount to a hill of beans. I can't imagine the pain that you have experienced. It, I tried to commit suicide numerous times. It, it, I have no contact any longer with any of my friends or my family or anyone. It puts you in a situation that I didn't know anything about anything. So I was mm-hmm. planning on having a baby. I don't even know anyone who had kids. I was older. And um, I, just, uh, I, I just thought I was going to be like everybody else. And it wasn't anything like that. And these are, um, you know, we have heard these stories. We've done, uh, you know, reporting around um, removal of, of uh, infants um, from Indigenous women. Um, what supports did you need at that time to be able to, to, I guess, what do you need in order to make this change for yourself I, and for I, others? I'm, I'm actually, uh, I was a paralegal for 10 years and a, a legal uh, assistant for 15 years uh, mm. for um, having a lot of uh, knowledge in, in you know certain areas mm. and so I went even to the um, Squamish Nation and um, I started going to you know classes and things like that um, you know these um, things like uh, NAA and all anything that I could do just to um, 
you know, tried to make myself look better. They said, you know, like, because you're not working, or you know, maybe you should. I started to volunteer, and I, I did everything. I, I went through all of the um, um, tests and everything with the um, specialists. You know, um, they had uh, me go into the, the children's services you've all jumped, the time. You've jumped to, through all the hoops, the legal hoops, yeah, is what and, you're saying. And I did go in there. They, yeah. they broke into my car and, oh, and took my dogs. And I had to pay like hundreds of dollars yeah. just because I was went to go visit my son, yeah. and I was parked outside the building. And they broke into the police, broke my. And, and I mean, it was unbelievable that I was yeah. going in there, and they would say things like, "Oh, um, I, I had um, I was dressed up with a, a dress and sandals on, but when I took my sandals off. I guess my feet were dirty." They're making comments on that. It was, it was like nonstop where. If he was crying, they're going, well, maybe, you know, um, you, you know, you're not that apt or, you know, to take care of him or whatever. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Mm. He doesn't know me. I get to see him an hour or two a week. You know oh, I mean? Definitely. I do everything that you say, and it doesn't make any difference. I, I change his diaper, and they go, oh, well, it looks like you put it on too tight. It, it's just nonstop it's, everything they, they could do. You, to, um, yeah, and you've been through this, and, and um, this is an experience that we've, heard um, from other uh, Indigenous mothers as well. I'm so sorry that you've been through this, and I hope that there's some some avenue or recourse that you're able to take. Deborah, thank you very much um, uh, on the topic of what needs to change um, when it comes to the child welfare system. Deborah, they're talking about her experience of having her um, her young son at 10 days old removed from her, and she says that um, being Métis um, has was a factor in that, and she's been trying to um, get reunited with him. Uh, Deborah, thank you for your call. I really appreciate hearing from you. Let's hear now from a social services voice and aspect on this. One of the big issues the ministry faces are staff shortages, and this is something that we've heard in the case in this report from uh, the representative for children and youth as well. Joining us now is Keyshawn Roy, executive director of the Federation of Community Social Services of BC. Uh, Keyshawn, good afternoon. Hi, Keyshawn, can you hear me? I think Keyshawn, I can see him connected there, but I believe he doesn't have our audio. Can you hear me, Keyshawn? Perfectly, yes. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Um, when it comes to social work and staffing, social worker and staffing, what needs to change? Well, it doesn't just need to change in government. We as a society have a recruitment and retention issue when it comes to people choosing social services uh, as a career choice. And this applies through universities and immigration. Um, this is a rule where you need people in every community, real people all over the land, to choose this as a career. And the Ministry of Children and Families is having recruitment and retention issues, but so are social service providers nonprofit mm. and private sector. Mm. And um, there's a changing jurisdiction uh, to uh, uh, towards uh, Indigenous authorities and First Nations governments. Mm -hmm. They will also have uh, recruitment and retention issues. It's one of the issues that us as a society need to invest in. In fact, there will be another report uh, next week from the representative for children and youth about staffing and about workloads. So how do you see um, more support then so that those workloads are eased for social workers at, at any agency or government or ministry that they're working with? Well, the, as best I can tell, the um, these are challenging roles individually mm -hmm. for the people. This is a, an investigation about one child's death, but... Uh, throughout the system, there are real people that we employ as a society tasked to do very difficult jobs on our behalf, uh, dealing with a lot of trauma on an ongoing basis from person to person all day long. We need to think about those roles and how to um, make sure that we uh, ha not only keep people in them, because uh, if you can imagine somebody who needs ongoing medical health, mental health support, transition of staff is one of the things that can reduce the effectiveness of that treatment. So for the people who need care, we need to build a lot of stability within the social services mm. and the people who work there. Some of that's compensation based. Uh, the government has started some work about 
pairing a lot of these positions with health authorities when it comes to compensation. Uh, some of it's peer networking. People in community need to know each other. Uh, in this case, uh, in, in particular, if people in community were meeting with each other regularly and talking to each other and trusted each other, um, I think these are the kind of tools we can do to, um, that we can utilize that share knowledge uh, among social workers that help them know each other, help them support each other, and that help kids. I can certainly empathize with um, with social workers who are, who are trying to do their jobs, and as you say, maybe faced with um, with uh, trauma on a daily basis. I guess the, what people may be frustrated by is just how frequently we have heard this conversation, right? Even um, Dr. Charlesworth re Charlesworth's report points out that over more than three decades, dozens of reports about child and family services in BC have been written and released by various organizations. Hundreds of recommendations have been made. Millions of dollars have been invested by the government in an attempt uh, to address those recommendations. And yet here we are, very sadly again, um, can can all the things that you're talking about actually happen? They can happen. Uh, they need to happen. And the time to start making it happen is now. Another thing related to this that Dr. Charlesworth mentioned in the report is a lot of these systems were designed uh, by colonial entities mm. in the 50s and 60s. And that a lot of the trauma people are experiencing, and in some cases, um, their families in many cases are intergenerationally experiencing, it goes back to uh, the residential school system. Mm -hmm. Our sister system of care uh, for children in this province and particularly indigenous children has not ever been built or designed around every child matters. It's been uh, federal and provincial systems rolled out through health authorities. It has, when these systems were designed, First Nations people didn't even have the legal right to vote so, you know, these systems were designed to not include Indigenous people and a redesign of any type that doesn't place uh, every child in every community, and in particular First Nations people who are not just dramatically overrepresented uh, when it comes to uh, these incidents you speak of and in the system of care right now. It's two-thirds of people are Indigenous. You know, we, we failed as a society. And uh, we probably uh, needed this report to tell us when to wholly overhaul what we have now and build it back up with a, a different ideology, a different way of thinking. Because the uh, idea of provincial governments taking Indigenous children away from their families is something that's plagued us as a as a, something we keep doing as mm. a society for the past hundred years. So are we going to stop doing that? Are we going to have indigenous uh, nations accountable and responsible uh, for child welfare? The government has started some work in transferring jurisdiction, but those uh, nations will need help and support, uh, funding, peer networking with the, their colleagues in the sector. Um, but what we've not tried. In over 150 years, uh, in this particular province, um, is is supporting First Nations in providing care and to to children, and we've not tried not taking their children away. So I think this report has a number of uh, there's not only a number of recommendations we should take on. It has some important insights into the systemic faults of our system, mm. and there's probably nobody more qualified to have led this uh, massive investigation than Dr. Charlesworth, who has, uh, who, who knows people in every community in this province and has been working through this system for decades and has written these previous reports. This is her largest or most consequential and probably the most important and uh, at, a, at a critical time in society, mm -hmm. not just because of an election coming up, not just because uh, of children who uh, are either being harmed or being murdered, and not just because uh, we're reevaluating our colonial practices, but because children today have just been experiencing uh, through COVID, war, disease, probably more than many other children, 
taken out of schools, taken out of uh, regular practices, put in difficult challenges. This particular generation of kids right now needs our help in a way that at no time in the past hundred years they did. Hmm. So we have a responsibility as, as people uh, to take care of our own children and this society and this is our best expert giving her best advice mm. consulting with thousands of people around the province and uh, i think this is maybe the call we, to action we need but the, the timing um uh, is never anything you can avoid when it comes to a death what, what, what we can um what we can work on is our response really appreciate hearing from you thank you so much Thank you. Keyshawn Roy, Executive Director of the Federation of Community Social Services of BC. We will continue with this topic. And in fact, we have uh, someone waiting on the line um, to join us. And uh, Michael Crawford, the president of the BC Association for Social Workers, is called in. And Michael, we'll get to your call right after the CBC News update. And here now is Robert Zimmerman. <laughs> Good afternoon. The BC Wildfire Service is rushing an initial attack crew to a highly visible brush fire between Peachland and Summerland. The fire was reported in the past hours along Highway 97 and is currently listed at about a third of a hectare. Drive BC says the fire is affecting traffic in both directions. Premier David Eby says his government is considering its own legal action over a lack of fairness and federal equalization payments while providing full support to a challenge by Newfoundland and Labrador. EB says the two provinces are united in the goal of ensuring fair treatment from Ottawa. And the RCMP are pleading with drivers to slow down. Highway patrol officers have issued more than 130 tickets for excessive speed since the beginning of the month. Excessive speed is at least 40 kilometres over the posted limit. Last Friday, RCMP near Prince George clocked an Alberta driver at 212 kilometres an hour in a 100 zone. And now the forecast heat warnings continue for several sections of the province with highs around 40 in some areas. On the north coast, mainly cloudy this afternoon with a high of 19. Highs up to 33 and sunny in the peace. In the central interior, including Prince George, a high of 33 with some sunshine and a risk of thunderstorms. Highs up to 37 degrees with a mix of sun and cloud in the Kootenays. In the southern interior, including Kelowna, some sun and cloud with a high of 37 as well. And for Metro Vancouver, Greater Victoria and the Fraser Valley, a mix of sun and cloud this afternoon with highs from 26 to 30. That's your CBC News update from Vancouver. Rob, thank you very much. Rob Zimmerman in the CBC Vancouver Newsroom. And more now on uh, one of the stories in Rob's news update there. BC is backing Newfoundland and Labrador's lawsuit over federal equalization payments. And Premier David Eby says his government is considering its own lawsuit as well. The issue about so-called have provinces sending money to have not provinces, that has resulted in Ontario, among others, receiving money from Alberta, BC and Saskatchewan. And Eby says that needs to change. We feel that it's unreasonable for BC taxpayers to be sending money to the federal government to be distributed to provinces like Ontario through the Equalization Program, which is part of our Constitution. And the Constitution is really clear. It says that this program is to ensure a minimum level of service for all Canadians, which is something I think every British Columbian supports. What we struggle to support is the idea that when British Columbians are struggling with affordability, they're struggling with the cost of living, to, uh, to ask them to pay into a federal system that distributes money to another province that is not having challenges delivering basic services. Ontario has challenges, absolutely, we all do across Canada, but delivering basic services is not one of their challenges. The system is clearly broken, and the federal government made an explicit decision not to sit down and to renegotiate the formula with premiers. Every five years, they're supposed to do a review, and when you have problems like Ontario receiving a billion dollars in equalization over the last couple of years, uh, that's the time when you are able to address those issues in the formula. Unfortunately, they decided not to do that. And, uh, and so that leaves uh, only one venue available to us. That's Premier David Eby.
We've been taking your calls on the latest report from BC's representative for children and youth. Uh, Dr. Jennifer Charlesworth is calling for a complete overhaul of the province's foster care model. This following the abuse and death of an 11 year old boy in 2021. We're asking you for your reaction to this report. Uh, yet another scathing report calling for change to the much beleaguered Ministry of Children and Family Development. And if you have had experience with the child welfare system, do you think change is possible? And what is the overhaul that's needed? Michael is calling us from Kamloops. And Michael is the president of the BC Association for Social Workers. Really glad you called in, Michael. Thank you. Well, thanks for uh, uh, hosting this show. And with this particular topic, the representative has produced a report, which is one of her most consequential, significant reports. And, and many in the field will think about uh, placing this uh, report front and center with other reports like Thomas Gove's mm -hmm. report and Ted Hughes' report. It's that significant. Mm. Will the change be significant enough? Uh, what uh, Dr. Charlesworth is proposing is is, is an, a, an absolute uh, culture change within uh, the child welfare, uh, child and family service system. Uh, she's asking the government to move away from a policing, surveillance, protection, apprehension model uh, and move to a prevention model where the focus on the, is on the well-being of the child within the family. And essentially what that means is that government departments will now have to work together and they'll have to work with uh, community uh, agencies, with indigenous uh, communities and so forth. Um, and they'll have to coordinate that effort, they'll have to communicate better, uh, and they'll have to ensure that uh, families have adequate resources to raise children. And, and that, um, somewhat surprisingly, is a bit of a novel approach. Uh, to child welfare in British Columbia. Mm, and, and we heard in our last half hour from Cheryl Casimir, who talked about that call for the silos in government to be removed, essentially, so that there is more cross-collaboration when housing is involved, when uh, the Ministry um, for Poverty Reduction is involved. One of the recommendations is for MCFD to ensure that every family has a family plan as per policy that is co-created with family members and all members of the circle in an inclusive and culturally attuned way. So that goes to your point there. Michael, can you take me further into the, the daily life of a social worker? We have heard so much about a staffing shortage, about um, uh, an unmanageable workload. What is that like? What leads to um, uh, high turnover, to an inability to retain social workers? So we're asking child protection workers to do one of the toughest jobs uh, around uh, to make sure children and youth within families uh, and within communities are safe. And uh, we're often asking them to do that uh, and not providing them with the resources they, that they need to ensure that child will thrive and that child will, will continue to be safe. So I think that, present, that that situation produces a lot of, um, um, you know, uh, cognitive dissonance. It's, it's uh, you know, it's distress. There's a moral distress there. You've been given a job without the tools to do the job properly, and every day you go home having not done the job that you want to do, and you, and, and you complicate that. Um, by having uh, salaries which are lower in comparison to other provinces, um, inadequate supervision, inadequate continuing uh, education, um, and it and it just just piles on. Um, you know the, the 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 shortage is very real. Uh, MCFD and in fact many many within the child and family service sector are experiencing significant recruitment and retention problems. Uh, and uh, that's another rep that's another recommendation of Dr. Charlesworth's report is that they immediately implement uh, sort of a, a, a plan uh, to improve that recruitment and retention. What what MCFD, for example, has done in the past around this is they simply lowered educational qualifications, and uh, so many of the people that we call social workers that working within this system are not actually social workers. They have no social work training whatsoever. Uh, they're not eligible for registration with the regulatory college, the College of Social Workers in BC. Really, uh, and they may hold a BA degree in anthropology. 
Um, is that part of the problem then? Is that part of the problem then? Oh, I think I, I think that's part of what's missing in, in uh, Dr. Charlesworth's report is that she hasn't addressed uh, qualifications mm. properly. Um, okay, yeah, that's a significant problem uh, within uh, MCFD. We're asking people who are not trained to do the work to do the work. And that produces all sorts of uh, problems, including, we suspect, a uh, problem with retention. People are not trained to do a job. They stay in a job. Uh, they, it's, it's dissatisfying. It's distressing. And they leave. Just uh, very quickly here, as we have another caller who was, in fact, working on the front lines. Um, Michael, so what needs to change then? You're talking about qualifications. Um, you said there needs to be resources for uh, child welfare workers to be able to do their job. You know, what what do you think needs to change? Well, one of the one of the, our recommendations to government has repeatedly been that uh, you hire social workers and you hire other people, and there there needs to be a bit of a diversity uh, in training within the ministry uh, to ensure that there's a good diverse response to diverse problems. Kind we, of support we, staff. We, we appreciate that. But, but what we also need is that we need a level of accountability and we need a level of external oversight mm. of that work. Uh, and that's only accomplished by requiring all social workers in province, including those that work for MCFD, to be registered with their regulatory college, just as psychologists, occupational therapists, doctors, and so forth. They have a regulatory college that op- oversees their work in the field. We need that oversight of MCFD. Okay. Michael, really good to hear from you. I appreciate that you called in. Thank you. Thanks for addressing this topic. Michael Crawford is the president of the BC Association for Social Workers, and he was calling us from Kamloops. And uh, here's another call now on the topic of what needs to change in BC's youth foster system uh, in order to prevent tragedies like uh, what's been outlined here in this report from uh, the Children and Youth Representative. The case of... uh, the boy being referred to as Colby, um, who died after being transferred uh, to a home um, and had not been checked on um, in months, had not been visited by a social worker in months. Um, Reba is calling us from Powell River. Hi, Reba. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And uh, you have experience on the front lines. I have a lot of experience, and I just want to say that I do support many of the comments that the uh, uh, registrar off, or a CEO or whatever he was from our registration board, Michael mm-hmm. said. Mm-hmm. And yes, I was 24 years basically on the front line. Um, at many points, I was a uh, supervisor, and uh, I also had some brief time as a specialist um, in the area. And I was registered here in BC for practice until the last three or four months when I decided I needed to leave the field altogether. I'm also someone with um, lived experience in this field course that goes back to a time in history but not much has changed since the early 60s Mm. i'm also a metis individual so i um speak from sort of a different level of understanding what i support that uh, mr crawford or mike said is that everyone practicing in this field should be a registered social worker Um, it makes it very complex for people in small remote rural areas or for indigenous people that haven't Um, for a number of socioeconomic reasons, made it to university. But um, I have um, been someone on the end-of-child death reviews in another province. Um, I'm someone myself that had a horror story of um, um, uh, an adoption and then foster care till I aged out. And uh, for all those years, things just recirculate. Nothing has changed. And the support for foster parents is sadly lacking. Mm. Um, and, you know, and that's one thing. And my daughter at this point is wanting to go into social work. She has started, and I've begged her to stay away from child protection because many of the frontline staff that go in there do not get their supervision they're promised. There's not time. The phones are ringing. They want to make solutions. There aren't resources to back it up and to assist families uh, to change, to keep their children or uh, not have the system involved in their life requires time it re- requires trust it requires some commitment on both sides and also some resources resources so, yeah yeah we don't have any we really don't have that and i'm almost of the opinion now that uh, it, it, as far as the over rep sick over representation of um, indigenous children in the system mm-hmm. um, I, i'm almost
almost of the belief, and it's a bit of a dichotomy as far as um, registration goes, is that only sort of minority people should be serving that population that understand and have lived some of these issues. Because this, these child's lives really just, just become um, a big number on a printout, you know, a, a big name and a number. And people just can't get to them. Like, social workers just can't. And uh, the average length of turnover, especially on intake investigation apprehension in, in the areas, back in the day when things were more stable in the 80s, um, was 18 months, a year and a half. You know, and a lot of complaints of families, children in care is that, oh, my God, another new social worker, another new social worker. Hmm. And and their perception is, as was mine um, growing up in it, is that they don't come around unless, you know, they want something or they're moving you to another foster home. Hmm. And uh, Regardless of requirements? Are they not? Oh, yes. They can't get to them. You've got a caseload of 40 to 60 kids. The families that go with them and some of the other services that might be involved or brokered, you know, heaped with layers of um, confidentiality and consents for release of information and Mm. all the other backgrounder colonial type paperwork stuff that is required and has to get done. Um, There's very little seeing the children or supporting the foster families. And And then if there's court work involved, um, many of these frontline child protection social workers do their own court applications and court process. A lawyer is only brought in in the area of contested business. Um, you know, one of those are, are, are hours and I hours. can imagine the time, yeah. how time-consuming that is. And Reba, you said, so you had worked for 24 years yes. um, as a, social, a registered social yes. worker. You just yes. stopped, you just left a few months ago. No, I left child protection actually in 2014 Okay. Um, in a territory where I was working. Mm-hmm. And uh, it just seemed like the older I got and the more I seen... And, um, you know, and this is a territory that tries very hard to not bring Indigenous kids into care. But basically, I could count the number of non-Indigenous children on my fingers and toes. And we had over 250 children in care in that um, territory at that time. And I just, I just couldn't, I just couldn't do it anymore. I just couldn't. I was at home single parenting and all I could think of when I was at home and should have been sleeping or paying attention to my own children were kids that I knew were left at risk, either in their families or in foster homes Mm. of these situations that there just seemed to be no solution for um, or no resources for. And it just, it haunted me. It haunted me. And so I did carry on and do registered social work in some other capacities until uh, February of this year and decided that at 60, it's time for me to um, try to find some happy work. (laughs) I hope you do. You have carried a lot. Um, Can I ask you then, just in our last couple of minutes Mm -hmm. here, um, what supports are needed? What would you, I mean, we heard this earlier um, from uh, Shell Casimir as well. You need support to do your job. Yes, and it would start if there would be some recognition that a caseload, in order to do real justice and affect change in families, many of these families, by the time they get to the doorstep of child protection, have some very, very entrenched patterns and dysfunction. If that's where we're going to start our intervention in our society, the caseload should be no more than 10 to 12, period. You know, and um, these big caseloads, sometimes it takes two hours to drive to see a child. You know, it depends how Mm. um, rural or urban places are. Mm -hmm. So smaller caseloads and then some real support of somebody who's actually been doing the job for five years plus. I've seen supervisors Mm. and heard of supervisors now that have had like six months a frontline experience. Well, you know, they don't even know what the work really is at that point. It, it, it's it's very difficult. And they're very, supposed very to be the mentor in that case. Absolutely. Yeah. And the newlings that don't have a BSW or a child um, protection practicum come into the work thinking that all these bad habits or, or what a newbie mm. is telling them as a supervisor is the practice. Mm. And it's not. And uh, I just think right across the board in Canada, Every child protection worker should have a BSW and should be registered, period. You're echoing and, uh, the, the, the point there from uh, Michael Mike. as well. Yeah. 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 Reba. Again, smaller caseloads and real support from a supervisor that has experience. Those are very tangible uh, recommendations from you. Really appreciate hearing from you. Thanks so much. 
Thank you. Take Bye-bye. care. All the best. That's Reba calling us from Powell River. Uh, lots of emails uh, we're getting on this topic as well. Ray writes, I would think that foster kids in a new place should be checked on weekly until the caseworker determines that visits, visits can be extended. Every kid is different and every situation different. Some visits may never go more than a week and some may be extended beyond 90 days. Carla writes, I was in the foster care system in my youth. There's wonderful parents out there. I have, however, in my adult life met foster parents and some of the comments are beyond horrific. Thank you so much uh, for sharing your experiences and uh, your thoughts on this topic. There will be much, much more um, coverage of this coming up on the afternoon show as well uh, in your area here uh, on CBC Radio 1 and throughout the day on cbc.ca slash bc and coverage tonight as well. You can watch CBC News at 6 o'clock. And we will cover um, the move away from cash uh, during payment on another show. But really appreciate all the calls. And we decided to extend the topic as a result of your comments. So really appreciate hearing from you. You can email us, bctoday at cbc.ca.